So good morning, everybody. Um, so first of all, it's a great honor uh, to be here. And I will get to my talk in a minute, but as uh, John alluded to, he asked if I would uh, would make a few comments about Mitch, um, which is not going to be uh, particularly uh, easy for me. Um, So so, so Mitch Fink is uh, someone who many, probably nearly everyone in this room has known in one way or another. He's really... Uh, uh, he really put together an amazing career in the field of critical care medicine, as John alluded to. Um, he amassed a huge amount of experimental research, teasing out the cellular and organ dysfunction in sepsis multisystem organ failure. But in addition to that, he also had great vision about the future of critical care. Uh, he helped launch, or did launch, the country's first university-based Department of Critical Care Medicine, advancing the notion of uh, multidisciplinary critical care. Um, In addition, he was a great entrepreneur. Having trained as a chemist, he was always inventive and thinking about novel molecules. He had many patents. He even served as uh, CEO of a biotech company. And then in the end, returned back to UCLA where he was working for the last few years uh, before he he fell um, he fell ill in the summer and then unfortunately died um, in November. Uh, since his death, um, there have been a number of really beautiful tributes and obituaries written um, uh, about all that Mitch meant uh, and I think when I think about it, I think I, it For me, one of the things that I struggle with is probably beyond all the words, there are probably two uh, enduring and somewhat contradictory emotions. Uh, On the one hand, um, there's just an overwhelming sense of sadness that um, someone who was so dynamic uh, and so much in all of our lives should be taken from us um, uh, so prematurely. And at the same time, I think uh, I feel a sense of uh, gratitude that he was that he was in our lives, uh, and that he uh, he gave all of his talent to our field. I think anyone that knows him knows not only did he have an intelligence and a logic that was dizzying, but that uh, he delivered it with humility and with grace. He never let anyone feel uncomfortable. He was. Um, beautiful in the way uh, uh, he held and supported uh, trainees. Uh, put together, there's, there's been an old adage in science and medicine for a long time that fields move slowly like great rocks that are, that are rolled forward slowly and that no single individual can be responsible for completely changing a field, but r- rather, in any era, we really stand like, the, the adage goes, we stand like children upon the shoulders of giants, that it's only by standing on those giants from the past that we can get to see further. And I think uh, uh, with Mitch, as, as, as John has said, he was a giant in our field, and he's a giant, a giant who fell too early, but who left us with a pair of shoulders upon which we have all got to stand and we have all got to see a little bit further. And so, thank you, Mitch. Okay, so so now we have to change gear. So I got asked to talk a little bit about uh, something that's been bothering me for a while, and that is uh, what goes on in the clinical trial space and what goes on in the clinical care space, and do we really join them enough? And I'm going to try to lay out some sense of a possible vision of what I've entitled ICU trials in the digital age and how we might fuse care with research. And I'm going to start by going back in time and start with this very good-looking Scotsman. <clears throat> this is Archie Cochrane. And Archie Cochrane uh, was asked to comment not on research, 
but on care. On the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, it had been put in place shortly after the Second World War and after its first 20 or so years in the early 70s, Archie wrote a book. And in the book, he said, you know, the villains in the National Health Service are the physicians. They just make shit up. (laughs) And he said, the true hero is the randomized clinical trial. And doctors must base what they do on randomized clinical trials. Now, of course, the best place, words can often go down strange paths. And Cochrane collaboration, evidence-based medicine, has sometimes become a swear word in some people's minds. But the original intent was an honest one. He was motivated by the fact that he knew when he looked at any set of patients with a bunch of, with a particular disease, they were incredibly varied in how sick their disease was. And that if you really wanted to know how something worked, you had to flip a coin. The beauty of the randomized clinical trial is the R, the randomization. Because when you do that, you can split the group in half, you can give one half treatment, the other placebo. You can wait over time, and then if over time it turns out that there's more smiley faces with one arm and more people who still look bad in the other, then when you compare the results, you can say that was because of the therapy. It wasn't associated with the therapy. It was because of the therapy. And this is singularly, singularly, because randomization, balance, measured and unmeasured variables, the stuff we don't know about, that gets divided too. If you were trying to find the cause of lung cancer and you didn't know about smoking, you would have thought being male caused lung cancer. We can't always think about unmeasured variables. There's always things going on in the background we don't understand. The heart of the RCT is the R, and the heart of the R is the fact that it's balancing unmeasured variables to balance out both groups. Where he got this idea was a trial he was involved in. It was in pneumonia. It was in tuberculous pneumonia, and it was the first randomized trial in medicine, the famous Bradford Hill uh, experiment, where they compared treatment A to treatment B. Treatment A was streptomycin, and treatment B was not streptomycin. Not that sophisticated. Now, some might argue you didn't actually need the trial, and you can probably guess the outcome. Not having anti-tuberculous treatment is not as good as having anti-tuberculous treatment when you have tuberculosis. But this was the beginning of the randomized trial movement. He launched this, and the good news is when he launched it in the entire field of medicine, there were less than 200 trials being run per year in the early 70s. By 2010, if you believe the numbers, 37,000 randomized trials were launched. I didn't even know we had 37,000 unanswered questions. And then another 37,000 or more were launched in 2011, and we're now doing over 50,000 new RCTs per year. It's pretty much the bedrock for anything that's going to be approved by the FDA or the EMA. Sounds like a great story. The other good news is we've got better at them. We actually randomize properly. We've learned about blinding. We remember to get consent most of the time. Uh, And we pretty much report pretty much the results of the actual experiment that we designed in the first place. So this is great. But, and life begins after but, there are things that drive us mad about RCTs. First of all, oh, They're way too narrow. Look at who they enroll. Look at the long exclusion criteria. This is a weird, strange patient population. That's not very helpful for my practice. Way too narrow. Oh, but it's also too broad. It's the Goldilocks problem. You just gave me one number. You said it was a 6% mortality reduction. But there's no way every patient is getting a 6% mortality reduction. In fact, each patient either lives or dies. It's not actually precise enough. 
There's all sorts of different patients. They're all going to have different likelihood of benefiting or being harmed by the therapy. An average single number isn't actually that helpful for my practice. The other thing is, you know, I remember your whole thing about tuberculosis pneumonia in 1948. When I admit a, a patient with pneumonia today to the ICU, they don't look the same. There's like a lot of stuff going on and long, long order sheets for all sorts of therapies that I'm giving those patients. And so it's not very helpful to just compare A to B. What I want to know is A versus treatment B versus C versus D. And maybe it depends on whether I'm also giving treatment E or treatment F. It's much more complex. Those are the decisions we wrestle with on morning rounds every day. And RCTs are hopeless. RCTs show up with this incredibly narrow piece of information. Having said all of that, I also would like you to just tell me the answer. Because I don't really want to put my patients in the RCT, especially if it's an approved therapy. The FDA has already decided it's available. I want to start using it. I don't want my patient to be a guinea pig. I don't want to ask them. This isn't my job. We've created parallel universes. Archie Cochran said we should be doing RCTs as part of clinical care. And somewhere on the way to the fair, we ended up creating two parallel worlds. They look like each other, but they are really not the same. Different people, different incentives, and so forth. Okay, things may be changing. Now we're entering this era of so-called big data, and I can never decide whether big data should be capitalized or not. I'm almost feeling like I'm playing into the trap if I say capital B and capital D. If you watch the Super Bowl, if you watched any NFL game, one of the ads running was from IBM about Big Blue, Watson, how it's going to answer all of our questions. And one of the examples is the BioView initiative at Vanderbilt, where Big Blue is going to take all of the information from the electronic health record. They're also going to take all sorts of discarded blood, run all sorts of fancy genomics, and it's going to give you all the answers you need. It's going to make causal inferences on optimal care that will be broad because it's doing it on all patients. So it solved the real-world practice problem, not like these pesky RCTs that only enroll weird patients. But at the same time, it's going to be narrow. It's going to be personalized to your very patient right in front of you. It's going to be comparative because everything's in the chart. It can see all the different therapies. So it, absolutely, it sounds fantastic. sounds like job is done. Not only that, it's even hoping to do it really, really quickly so that when you're at the bedside, the computer will run on all the prior patients, compare them to this patient in front of you, and give you a green go button to press right there. It will pop up on the screen, do this. Don't give them treatment A, give them treatment B, because they're going to do better with treatment B. So, so this sounds terrific. And in fact, lots of people have bought into this. And when I say people, I mean big people. I mean the NIH, I mean PCORI, I mean the Institute of Medicine, who've articulated that this is the path towards true self-learning healthcare systems. This is our future. So that sounds great. So if we go back to Archie, and we ask Archie to pull out sort of an evidence generator report card, and we say, have we answered all our problems? If we take big data analytics, it's great, because... We have all spent a lot of money on the electronic health record, and now finally it's going to do something useful for us. So it's leveraging the EHR, that's low incremental cost. It's gener generating real-world effectiveness. It's considering multiple therapies. It's generating personalized estimates. It's offering live tailored options, and there's just one small issue. It's not actually true <laughs> that these... Live personalized estimates are useful. They could actually be wrong because they're going to be, they have the problem that there's no randomization. For causal inference, randomize. And so all the trialists say, I hate all this talk about all this big data stuff. You guys need to be randomizing. And by the way, we're here, we're here. we've got new trials for you. They're much better. You said you need to leverage the electronic health record. We can do that. We have these things called point-of-care clinical trials. We're going to look for a clinical moment in the electronic health record that alerts the clinical trial machinery. 
And we already have an example. The Veterans Administration, EHR, was used in a paper published in 2011, inpatient diabetics with high blood sugars, when the physician went into CPOE to order either sliding scale or a weight-based algorithm, the computer went, aha, I see your patient's diabetic. I see the sugar doesn't look very good. I see you're about to order either sliding scale or weight-based algorithm. And you know, we're not sure which is best. So why don't you randomize the patient? And then we'll all find out which is best. So this is great. And indeed, people became so enamored with this, it was only a small study. We've just launched in the fall of 2015 two huge initiatives that look just like this. One is targeting two thiazide diuretics in 13,000 hypertensive patients in the VA. And then the other one running through PCORI is going to compare two aspirin doses in 20,000 patients with underlying cardiovascular disease. Okay. Sounds great. Let's go back to our evidence generated report card. So we're leveraging the EHR, low incremental cost, real world effectiveness, and robust causal inference this time. We've done it. No, not exactly. I wouldn't say two aspirin doses is exactly a complex consideration of all the therapies going on in our patients. It's also not personalized. It's still just 50-50. It's basically saying, yeah, we still need your patients to be a guinea pig, but it's going to be easier for us to do the RCT because we're going to nest it inside the EHR. So this gets like a, nah, doesn't sound too good. I said, okay, okay, okay. So the trialists say, well, we, we know some other trialists, and they're doing something else. They're doing something called platform trials. This will be what you need. So what are platform trials? Platform trials are the latest, latest extension of a set of trials called adaptive trials. Adaptive trials are trials that use the data in the trial almost like a roadmap to go in slightly different directions and not just the directions that you thought you were going to go into at the beginning of the trial. There are some scary things about adaptive trials. In fact, some of them are called adaptive and wildly adaptive. They focus on the disease when they're a platform and not just the therapy. So it's an entire platform of ongoing trials where you could be testing multiple things, but always in the same disease. You could have multiple interventions and you could essentially have perpetual enrollment, which gets interesting when you're writing the grant application, you get to the sample size section. And even more interesting when you get to the budget. Infinite patients, infinite dollars. Can I have some more? In general, it's based on Bayes' theorem, which I'm not going to talk about too much today. You can all take a big sort of sigh of relief. But suffice to say that Bayes' theorem is far more flexible in handling variable sample size. And it allows you to tailor choices over time. Interestingly, though, this field has really been going on in the pre-approval space. The emphasis has been on efficiency with very small sample sizes with different therapies graduating to the next phase. So in fact, the poster child is the iSpy2 program, which is testing different therapies in phase two for breast cancer. And if they look good, then they graduate to getting a phase three study. It's not by accident that it's in breast cancer. This is driven by women with breast cancer. They were very interested in accelerating the pace of change in their field. This is driven by the Susan G. Komen Foundation, along with several pharmaceutical companies, the NIH and the FDA, for the need to let no patient be missed and the need to have no downtime between trials and the need to try to have a much more efficient learning machinery. What's he talking about? Let's just pause for a second to give you a little flavor. This is going to be like ClinEpi 101 on exactly what this new fancy platform thing is. If we stand with a normal RCT and we start out with a bunch of patients at the beginning, we're now getting to know them quite well. We've seen this slide before. Um, we have these patients and they're sitting here with a bunch of different diseases. We're still going to randomize. And at the beginning, we have no idea which therapy is better. Okay, 
we put our blinkers on, we run the trial, and then at the end, we, un- we reveal everything, and we go, oh, A is better than B, and we're very, 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 very sure. Good. It's interesting. At the beginning, you were 50-50. Now you're completely sure. What about in the middle? What about in the middle? Imagine you were doing a trial of A versus B in 400 patients. You've enrolled 40 patients, so you're 10% of the way into the trial. And I should have probably put alive in green to suggest that they're really alive as opposed to just alive and hypoxic. But, <clears throat> but nonetheless, trust me, being blue, this is the one time in this whole meeting where being blue is good. So... <clears throat> uh, after 40 patients, you started out enrolling. It's the same number of patients, 20 patients in each arm. But it turned out that A was doing pretty well. In fact, at this point, the probability that A is superior to B is 78%. Okay, that would be fine. This would all be under the hood. No one would be looking at all of this. Imagine if you were. Imagine if the 41st patient was your uncle. Which arm? Would you like your uncle to be put in? You're allowed to answer. Well, you don't know. You have complete equipoise. You're quite sure you don't care. 50-50. If this were a breast cancer trial, people would be saying, I would like the odds of being in A to go up. I would like the 41st patient, if I roll the dice, I'd like the dice to be weighted it can still be random, but it won't have a 50-50 chance. Well, 50-50, you know what I mean. Flip a coin. It won't have a 50-50 chance of lying on heads. It'll actually be weighted so that most patients will get A. And so if you actually did that, and if you started putting more patients into the A arm, then if you were right, 40 patients later, if your hunch was right, you'd have a lot more survivors in A, and you would have minimized exposure to B. At this point, with 80 patients in, you're now almost 100% sure that A is better than B, and you stop the trial, only 80 patients done. This is an example of adapting the trial. Specifically, it's something called response adaptive randomization. So you start with the patient, you're going to randomly flip to A versus B, but the key here is that the trial is developing a memory. As each patient goes through the trial, that's data. And if you had pre-specified a model that was waiting to be populated with data, that model can then update and change the randomization scheme later. And it can do it not only to wait towards the best therapy, it can do it to activate different arms, it can do it to drop arms, and it can even do it separately for different kinds of patients. More sick patients versus less sick patients, septic patients from with pneumonia versus intra-abdominal sepsis, they can all have different weighted odds. So if we go back to our generator card, now we could say, look, platform trials are terrific because they can consider multiple therapies, personalized estimates. Now we're getting live tailored options. We're not making everyone a guinea pig. This sounds great and robust causal inference. The only problem is this has not been leveraging the EHR. It's not been at low incremental cost and it's not been generating real world effectiveness. It's been going on in this very tight, pre-approval space with experimental therapies. So what we need to do is to try to combine point-of-care trials with platform trials. And that's so-called REMAP, and it's the daughter of both platform trials and point-of-care trials. Randomized, it's a mouthful, randomized embedded multifactorial adaptive platform trials. And there's already one getting up and running, and it's in critical care. It's not in the U.S., but it's in critical care. It's in everywhere except for the U.S., as best I can tell. (coughs) Funded with a large grant from the European Union of 25 million euros, and now with an additional 6 million from the Australian NHMRC. It's one large program testing severe pneumonia, and it's simultaneously testing multiple things. Different antimicrobial strategies, different host immune modulation strategies, different ventilation strategies with separate response adaptive randomization and stopping rules for different subgroups. The key here is that patients are preferentially assigned to the best performing arm. 
So allocation is random. You are rolling the dice, but not 50-50. The odds of assignment are proportional to the odds of success, and so patients are not guinea pigs. Now, this, this slide is a load, but basically... <clears throat> It's embedded in that it's being triggered from ICU admission orders. It's already approved in the Netherlands with something called delayed consent, which doesn't exactly exist in the U.S., but <clears throat> it's up and running. Um, it's considering uh, three different antimicrobial strategies, two immunomodulation and two ventilation, which is three multiplied by two, multiplied by two, 12 possible regimens. The sort of the Chinese menu, one from A, one from B, one from C. So you can imagine the different combinations of therapies that people get. And it's testing them all in four subgroups of patients, those with and without shock at presentation, those with and without severe hypoxia. So you have 48 estimates of treatment outcomes being generated in this trial all simultaneously. Not, not one arm versus another, 48. And that's just the starting conditions. What it's trying to do is deliver on a promise. It's trying to get closer to the actual care decisions, to individualized treatment decisions. So, for example, if I ask the question, should my patient receive IV hydrocortisone? If I'm at the bedside, I have a pneumonia patient in front of me. Well, we all know what we do. We'd immediately look, in, look up the surviving sepsis guidelines, and they would tell us exactly whether we should give hydrocortisone or not. Of course, it's much more nuanced. You go, well, are they in shock? Because, you know, there's some studies of hydrocortisone in shock, and if they're not in shock, then our preponderance of evidence for giving hydrocortisone might vary. Well, how hypoxic are they? What do you think you're giving the steroids for? Is it to try to stop the ARDS turning into fibrotic ARDS? There's some literature on that, too. Wait a minute. Could this be viral pneumonia? Oh, well, it could be. Do you think viral pneumonia, uh, do you think steroids make more or less of a difference in viral pneumonia? Oh, should we give an antiviral? If we give an antiviral, if we don't give an antiviral and it is viral, is it a good thing to give steroids? I'm not coming up with crazy, strange things. I'm just telling you exactly what you would all discuss on the bedside. Pretty much all of this is now in the trial. The trial is considering all of those potential avenues, not necessarily everything. I'm sure you have colleagues who could think of even more things that are not in the trial, but the point is it's making a move towards trying to answer questions that are much more like the questions that you ask at the bedside and yet retaining randomization to make true, robust causal inference. So it generates a separate probability estimate for each of these considerations. And so the reason why it's hard to know about sample size is that the trial enrolls until you get a predefined level of certainty. As soon as any one question is answered, that question stops being asked. But the trial is still rolling about other questions. So the sample size is generated not to ask the question, but to get the answer. So what does it look like? Well, it's not your father's power calculation. It's a little hard to estimate the design of this. What you have to do in black is you have a schematic for the trial of patients coming through, getting randomized to different things, and then you basically have to create a virtual set of populations and run simulations in silico ahead of time under all sorts of possible scenarios. So, for example, if we were just, this is a scenario that shows where we're only testing eight regimens. If it turns out that it really was true. The trial doesn't know this yet, but if it turned out that it really was true, that arms five and eight really are the best arms, and these other arms are like pretty miserable arms because this is the probability of death. If this were the actual truth in a large simulated data set, and then you ran the trial, the trial know, doesn't know the truth. When you run the trial and you run simulations of those trials, it turns out that if you did a traditional design at 2,000 patients, every patient in the eight arms, there'd be 250 patients in each arm. That's the black line. But the trials, on average, they sniff some things up. They learn 
as they're pulling these patients in and, exper- and, they, and experiencing these differences in outcomes, even though they don't know with certainty, they begin to think, huh, it's sniffing around and it's sensing that regimens 5 and 8 look better than the other regimens. And so it starts changing the odds for the very next patient. And so you can see that on... At- oh, and I have no idea how I go backwards. <laughs> oh, big data. <coughs> you can see in gray the actual number of patients in each arm. And hardly any patients got put in the red arms. A few patients were put in the indeterminate arms, and the trial was loading all the patients into the arms that ended up being good. And so at 2,000 patients in, it is actually, this is power in red. It's actually got the same or more power as a traditional design, but it did it while saving 80 people. 80 people would have died in the learning of the information under the traditional design. If it turns out that just one regimen was best over here, a very similar thing, it learns even earlier. It spends a little bit of time thinking, this arm doesn't look too bad, and so it puts a few more patients in here. It's far better powered. It puts far more patients in here, and there are 94 fewer deaths. These are examples of the way in which you test the behavior of the trial. And once you start doing this, it's actually very hard to imagine you would ever go back to a trial where you're just going to expose everyone randomly all the way through the trial, a true guinea pig trial. Now, I do not have time to go through all of the buts, but lordy, there's buts. It's a plenary talk. I get to not take questions. (laughs) So I just throw a slide up here saying, yeah, there's some work to be done. Lordy, there's work to be done. The EHR data are only as good as the data. Now, it turns out that the trial design can actually tolerate messiness in the data. But nonetheless, I'm not trivializing that working with EHR is a bit of a nightmare. Well, (laughs) nothing to do with remap. Working with the EHR is a bit of a nightmare, period. But nonetheless, that's an issue. You need institutional commitment. There's definitely ethical issues that need to be worked out. I already gave you a flavor of how the design is quite complex. But one thing I would point out is that the complexity is on the inside. At the bedside, all that happens is you go, aha, I'm admitting someone to the ICU for pneumonia. You hit the button, and the order sheet comes out just like a recipe. Or this patient gets a macrolide. This patient goes on the high peep arm. This patient does get steroids. It's quite simple. It's not complicated at the bedside. The work is all under the hood. Uh, there's definitely issues about reporting and dissemination of results, funding, oversight, and also integration with our traditional clinical research program. And I, I, I get that those are issues. So anyway, I've tried to give you in this little talk, a little bit of a window on a few things relating to the world of clinical care and the world of clinical research. First, look, I I am absolutely with Archie Cochran on this, not just because I have a little brogue in my accent. Um, RCTs remain absolutely our strongest truth finder. We've never come up with a better way to make inferences of causality than randomizing. But the current RCT enterprise lets us down. It's really not delivering the questions that we need at the bedside for many of our questions. Now we have big data. Big data should not, absolutely not, be cast as an alternative to the RCT. There's many great things about big data, but it's not an alternative. That is a false choice to frame it that way. Instead, I would argue that the digital age enables novel RCT designs that are both smarter and safer. This is one opportunity to actually get something back from our investment in this digital electronic healthcare age. And so I'd leave you with the notion that self-learning healthcare is fused care and research. Thank you very much.